Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, one of the things happening this week, uh, this week marks the 75th anniversary of an important event in our nation's history. It's the 75th anniversary of D-Day, uh, June 6th, 1944. And that was a significant development in World War II, uh, D-Day, when the Allied forces went ashore. And those who participated in that event, you know, they're getting fewer and fewer in number, those who actually went ashore on D-Day. Uh, most of them would be in their 90s these days. And one thing that that group of people, one thing that they are, that group of people, they are an example of how the generations come and go. One generation rises and then falls and is replaced by another. One generation is replaced by another as people pass on. And the number of soldiers who actually went ashore on D-Day is getting smaller and smaller. You could add to that the idea that the number of people who lived through World War II, they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. The number of people who were born in the 1900s is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. The generations come and go, they rise and they fall. And you know, the Bible is right to compare us to the grass of the field or the flowers of the field that are here today and gone tomorrow. The generations, they rise and they fall. They come and they, and they go. But the good news is this, that God understands this about us, that the generations rise and fall, and he takes that into account when he looks at us. And he has provided for us an eternal hope and an eternal future in heaven. You see God thinking about the future and that idea that the generations, they come and they go. When, for example, he gives the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And do you remember how the Ten Commandments end? After God gives the Tenth Commandment, he makes this promise, and it's the close of the commandments in our catechism, that God, it is his intent to show love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. See, God's thinking about us, and he's thinking about how the generations come and go. And he is prepared, after he gives the Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai, he is prepared to show love and compassion to a thousand generations. God is thinking about us and our future. You see also that idea uh, when God, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, tells people to write these commandments on their door frames. Write them on your hands. Remember them. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you walk along the road. See, God's thinking about the future. He's thinking about the idea that the generations, they come and go. And each new generation, as it is raised up, it needs to be taught these things. This is important. You know, the commandments that God gave on Mount Sinai. You also see that reflected in the book of Ezra and uh, the book of Nehemiah. And how, remember then, how they, they returned from the Babylonian captivity, God's people did. And Ezra and Nehemiah, they gathered all the people together and they read to them out loud the Bible. And it says that men were there, women were there, children were there, anybody who could understand was there. And one of the things I'm sure that they would review is the Ten Commandments and teaching those things to the next generation so that everyone would understand. See, these are examples of how God, He understands who we are and what we are, and He takes that into account. And He has provided for us an eternal hope, an eternal future. He knows that, that the generations, they come and they go, they rise and they fall. But He's thinking about us and our salvation. And you see that in the Old Testament and in the way God gives the Ten Commandments and how He wants those things taught to each generation as they grow up. Another place where you see this idea that God, He understands who we are and He provides for us generation after generation is in our first reading for today from the book of Acts uh, where uh, Matthias is chosen to replace Judas Iscariot. Our reading from the book of Acts, it takes place uh, shortly after the ascension of Jesus into heaven. 
And Jesus, you remember when he ascended into heaven, he said to the disciples that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And it's important that they replace Judas so that that activity that Jesus commissioned them with could continue. That's one of the things going on in our uh, first reading today from the book of Acts. God, he understands who we are. He's important. Uh, it, he knows that it's important that each generation be taught. He knows it's important that this thing that he did there in Jerusalem, his dying and rising again, this needs to be taken to the ends of the earth. And so Judas Iscariot, he must be replaced. And so you see that idea of God caring about us. He knows who we are, that the generations rise and fall. You see it also in Paul's missionary journeys, that it's important to establish congregations all over the place so that future generations can be taught the Christian faith. And that makes me think about uh, last, re la last week's reading from the book of Acts. Remember how Paul was led by the Spirit to Macedonia, to the city of Philippi, and to Lydia, and the rest of the ladies gathered there at the river. You know, God wanted them to be a part of, uh, of, of his salvation and a part of his church. And it was important for the Apostle Paul to plant pastors in each of the congregations that he established so that as the generations come and go, as the generations rise and fall, all of them could be taught about our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then finally, one, plas one, one last place where you can see this uh, taking place. God understanding who we are, knowing that the generations come and go and rise and fall. You see that in the prayer that Jesus says in our gospel reading for today. John chapter 17, we call that the high priestly prayer of Jesus. It's Monday, Thursday. He himself is getting ready to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. There he will be arrested and his trial and death, crucifixion and all those things. They're about to take place. But before he leaves the upper room, he says a prayer to God. And our gospel reading for today is a part of that prayer. And you can see there that Jesus is thinking about the future generations, about those who will come after him. And he's thinking about their salvation. One of the things that Jesus prays is at the beginning of our gospel reading, he prays not just for these only, and he's thinking about the, the, the these in that part, uh, those are the apostles who are, who are right there with them. I'm praying, Heavenly Father, not just for these people who are with me today, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. See, Jesus is thinking about people like us. He's praying not just for his apostles who are right there in that room with him, but he's also praying for all those who will believe in him through their word. And that's people like us. We believe in Jesus through the word of the apostles and the activity of the Holy Spirit in the proclamation of that word. Jesus was thinking about future generations when he prayed that prayer in the upper room on that first Monday, Thursday. He prays for the future generations yet to come, that they would be one, even as he and his heavenly Father are one. Jesus prays for that thing that we call in the, uh, in the Nicene Creed, the one holy Christian and apostolic church. That's not the language that he uses, but that's who he's thinking about on that Monday, Thursday, when he prays that prayer. Jesus is thinking about future generations when he offers up his life as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. He's thinking about the generations yet to be born who will be taught about this way of salvation that comes through the shedding of his blood. You find that especially in Psalm 22, which Psalm 22, those are the words and thoughts of Jesus as he is crucified. And one of the things that he says toward the end of that Psalm, as he anticipates his death and his resurrection, he says from Psalm 22, Future generations will be taught about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. See, Jesus, even as he dies, he's thinking about people like us, people who haven't been born yet, but people who need the salvation that he gives through his blood. And Easter, as Jesus rises from the grave, uh, it's not just for Jesus, but that's for us also. He has promised to remember us who come so many generations after him, 
that he will raise us from our graves as well. You see it in Matthew 28, where Jesus, before he ascends into, into heaven, he says, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. He's thinking about each of the generations as they rise and fall. When Jesus institutes baptism and the Lord's Supper, and when he teaches his apostles about confession and absolution, and when he tells them to uh, proclaim this gospel to the ends of the earth, he is uh, these ways of creating and sustaining faith, He's thinking about uh, the generations yet to come, that through these things, the means of grace, future generations, God will inspire and feed faith. And finally, when we think about heaven, uh, that is your future because, God, because of God's love for you and his care for you. Heaven is body and soul redeemed forever from death, from eternity. And heaven, one of the ways to look at it is it is a gathering of all people from every generation uh, from Adam on, a gathering that will continue for eternity because of the love of our Savior, because of, love, of the love of God the Father. That is your future because of God's love for you and his care for you. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God that passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.